Great, thank you. So a revolution is coming in making things. You've no doubt seen all of the press about the wonders of 3D printing. And that's a distraction. That's not the revolution. And in fact, most of that's wrong. Uh, the coverage of 3D printing is a bit like in the 1950s coverage of uh, microwave ovens, explaining how the kitchen of the future is a microwave oven. And you have a microwave oven in your kitchen, but it certainly doesn't replace the rest of the kitchen. Uh, at the same time that was happening, in 1952, MIT connected the first computer to a milling machine. This was an offshoot of early air defense computers that were, was the first high-speed real-time computing. This was to make aircraft parts. And so from that point in 1952, what's grown forward is a digital revolution in making things, but the distinction isn't additive or subtractive. So these are current frontiers of digital fabrication, and the tools include cutting, grinding, lasers, plasmas, jets of water, wires, uh, knives, uh, bending pins, uh, weaving, molding, extruding, fusing, uh, bonding. Um, uh, a well-equipped facility to do digital fabrication today has all of these things. And in the present, the revolution is turning data into things, but it's not the distinction between additive and subtractive. These are the current machines we use to make stuff. And so the problem with the short-term coverage is it's, it, it's, again, it's like a kitchen is much more than a microwave oven. These are today's tools of digital fabrication. But that's not the real revolution. The real revolution is a much more fundamental one. Consider either a 3D printer or a 3D machine tool and compare it to a child playing with Lego bricks. Uh, the metrology of the bricks is built into the bricks, so the size of what the child builds isn't limited by the size of the assembler, unlike an NC mill or a 3D printer where position measurement is external. Uh, the bricks enforce a constraint when you snap them, so the tower is more accurate than the child. When you machine or print, errors accumulate. You can assemble dissimilar materials. It's hard to do that in a deposition process. And when you're done, you don't make trash. You disassemble the parts. There's enough information to separate them and reuse them, unlike 3D printing or machining that goes in the trash. Those are properties of discreetly assembled materials. And what's emerging in the science, the real research of digitizing fabrication, is how to digitize not the designs, but the materials themselves. And that's being done over maybe nine orders of magnitude and length scale. So I'm showing some of the research we're doing, where at one extreme, we're using uh, DNA origami to make uh, nanoscale bricks. The bricks code for relative orientation and then they can have nanocluster linkers to payloads. So in the same way you synthesize DNA, with this approach you synthesize geometry. You grow functional nanostructures. Um, in the middle I'm showing micro Lego for electronics, where instead of etching traces and vias and placing components, you place voxels of functional materials and assemble three-dimensional electronics reversibly. And in the top, I'm showing for aerospace linked carbon fiber, sort of carbon fiber Lego, that unlike a billion dollar um, factory to wind fiber and cook it, uh, makes light, sparse composite structures that it turns out are more than order of magnitude stronger than the way composites are made today. But this is all assembled out of tool and it's fully reversible. And then in turn, what we're learning how to do is in the things I'm showing in the middle is program the growth of these materials so a code you put into them doesn't just describe them, but the code actually becomes the materials themselves. So if there's time, I can tell you more about that. And we just met, ran a meeting uh, with the White House, uh, linked off uh, the CBA site at MIT for videos and presentations where we got together people working across all of these length scales to look at this emerging science of digital fabrication, the science of turning data into things. And so again, you can follow up there or I can tell you more. But now if we step back, there's a very, very, very close parallel between communication, computation, and fabrication now. 
Shannon digitized communication. If you haven't read it, he wrote the best master's thesis ever at MIT, went to the phone company, spent 10 years fighting over whether digital wins. Um, he, he won because the analog managers died, I was told by Bob Lucky. Um, and what Shannon showed was by communicating in symbols, a linear increase in system resource gives you an exponential reduction in error if the er noise is below a threshold. So that's called a threshold theorem, that exponential scaling is what it means to be digital. The heart of digital isn't one and zero, it's the exponential reduction in error from using symbols. That was Shannon's contribution from analog phones that degraded with distance, we have the internet. Exactly the same thing happened in uh, computing. On the left, I'm showing Von Neum, uh, sorry, Vannevar Bush's last great machine. This was an analog computer at MIT, a room full of gears and pulleys. The longer you ran it, the worse the answer was. Uh, a bigger group than Von Neumann, Winograd, Cowan showed essentially if you did Shannon for computation, viewed it as a channel, encoded in symbols, the same thing holds. There's an exponential reduction in error for a linear increase in system resource. And that's what lets the billionth transistor in a Pentium work as well as the first one. So you wouldn't carry an analog computer around. Today's state-of-the-art fabrication, billion dollar chip fab, frontiers of 3D printing, belong on the left. The design is digital, but there's no information in the material. Errors accumulate. There's no state in the material. The slides I showed you briefly are introducing what's emerging is a digitization of fabrication where you don't just digitize the design, you actually digitize the materials in the process. The computer doesn't control a tool, the computer becomes a tool. The program doesn't just describe a thing, the program actually becomes a thing. That's not a metaphor, it's something we're learning to do quite literally. And what's emerging from that now in hindsight is it's exactly the story with von Neumann and um, uh, Shannon. You wouldn't revert to an analog telephone. The distinction between analog and digital fabrication, material with state may sound semantic, but it's precisely mathematically the same thing as symbols in computing and computation, and the same kind of technology is emerging. And so this revolution in digitizing fabrication is lead, bringing the programmability of the digital world to the physical world. Now we're getting there in stages, from computers controlling machines to machines making machines to materials with codes to materials with programs. And in turn, there's a very close parallel if you follow from mainframes to mini computers to hobbyist computers to PCs. We're now going from the 1952 milling machine to facilities like the Fab Labs, I'll, I'll briefly mention, to machines that make their own parts, to the Star Trek replicator. And there's a very close parallel. And the lesson from this history is, um, the picture on the left, second down, is one of my favorite. It's Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie inventing Unix at Bell Labs on a PDP. And for those of you, and it looks like there's quite a few who date back to PDPs, um, it wasn't a, a computer. There was a processor rack and an I.O. rack and a disk and lots of cables and it was hard to use, but a work group could use it rather than a whole corporation. And so video games, email, word processing, everything you do today essentially happened then. And the lesson from that is it scaled exponentially, but you didn't have to wait for the iPhone to invent the internet. In the same sense, we're in the mini computer era of digital fab. It's not yet fully integrated, but the applications are happening today. Uh, I discovered that uh, uh, I wrote an NSF proposal to say I wanted one of every machine to make anything, and I got NSF on a good day, and that's how CBA started. Uh, but it took too long to teach people to use the machines. I started a class how to make anything, and I was just swamped with students I didn't expect to see, and then they were there, not surprisingly, to make stuff. So they did projects. Kelly made a device that saves up screens and plays it back later when it's convenient. And that's a web browser for parrots. It lets parrots surf the internet and talk to other parrots. Um, an alarm clock you wrestle with and prove that you're awake, or a dress that defends your personal space if somebody gets too close. And these happened so consistently year after year, I came to appreciate the students were answering a question I hadn't asked, which is what is all of this stuff good for? So um, uh, Ken Olson famously said, there's no reason to have a computer at home. Uh, DEC is twice over bankrupt, you have a computer at home. 
And the point is it's not there for inventory and payroll. It's to listen to music and talk to friends and do things you care about that really drove the personalization of computing. About the only company left from that era is IBM, and it survived because it completely changed its business. In the same sense, the students were showing the killer app of digital fabrication is personal fabrication. And the point of personal fabrication isn't to make what you can buy in stores, it's to make what you can't buy in stores. It's products for a market of one person. And that touches a passion unlike anything I've seen. Um, we spent so much NSF money, they said, show social impact because Congress told them NSF didn't know how to, we didn't know how to, but we thought the tools were, were cool. So rather than talk about it, we set up a little community lab. Think of this as like a PDP for fab. It's about 100K in all the tools I showed you, not just one of them. And we set up one, but they've doubled. There's a few hundred now all over the world, north, south, east, west, rural, urban, these community fab labs that are kind of the PDP era, inventing the internet for digital fabrication. Uh, this is one of the fab labs in Jalalabad in Afghanistan. There was no network infrastructure, so they used it uh, to make antennas and radios to make citywide internet as a bottom-up project. Uh, they didn't know enough there to do all of that, but anything you design in any of these labs, you can make in any of them. So collaborators all over the world participated in that, and then it's produced locally. Um, this is a fab lab in Barcelona run by artists and architects and designers who gave up on engineers getting all that stuff wrong, and they took it over for themselves. And this is a, a solar house they made for the European Solar Decathlon recently, including everything to do with it, the, um, the solar power, the controls, the furniture, all is just a rapid prototyping project. The interesting that hap thing that happened in that project is they're now running the city. The mayor, deputy mayor, city planner all come from that project, the Fab Lab. And the connection is 50% unempl youth unemployment in Barcelona, a whole generation being lost, yet the economy is based on buying stuff made far away. So they want to be globally connected for knowledge, but self-sufficiently locally for what they produce and consume. And so as urgent urban planning, they're filling the city with digital fabrication tools. Um, this is President Obama visiting one of these labs. Representative Bill Foster is just about to introduce this legislation to take these community labs and make a national lab out of connected local labs rather than a remote billion dollar facility. Um, uh, I'd say the hardest thing in this project is organizational capacity. Technology is going great, but if anybody can make anything, it breaks the boundaries of aid, education, research, industry, formal, informal. So we've had to do a great deal of organization building. And I'll end with um, education. Uh, this is a young boy in an Arctic village. I showed him how to use the tools. Next time I saw him, he was making robot trucks, designing every aspect of it. This is a young girl in essentially an apartheid era, shanty town in South Africa, who was using a fab lab in Sochengovi to do my classes at MIT. Kids like that were just falling off an educational cliff. And so in computing terms, you can view MIT as a mainframe. You go there for processing. You can fit a few thousand people. Uh, I don't like massive online classes. It's, it's like time sharing. You're a terminal plugged into the mainframe. There can be more terminals, but it's not really how learning happens. What we're doing in the, F the Fab Lab network is creating a Fab Academy where students have peers with in work groups with mentors with tools who are then linked by online content and distributed video. And the crucial connection between digital fabrication and education is once you're in a facility like this, it means you can download the campus. Once you have a bootstrap set of tools, um, you can design something in any of these facilities and make it in any other one. And so you can build all the infrastructure you need. A place like MIT, elite institutions like that are based on scarcity. You assume people are scarce, tools are scarce, and books are scarce. So you have to say no to almost everybody and fit into a small space. Uh, not, books are certainly online. Um, with broadband shared video, I see global colleagues more than most of my MIT colleagues because we're too busy to talk to each other. And then the crucial final piece is with these tools of digital fabrication, they bootstrap the ability to make almost anything and it's almost anything. There's things you still need billion dollar infrastructure, but there's an awful lot of stuff you don't. Um, all that sort of stuff you can produce on demand in this much more distributed way.
So I, I describe much more of this here. What's emerging is this digital revolution in fabrication. Imag wind back to the PDP era when the internet's being invented. The technology will evolve, but you can apply it today. It means everybody can make anything. Anybody can make almost anything anywhere. And it completely blows apart all of the boundaries we're used to of elite institutions and engineers versus consumers. And so the challenge and the opportunity is building organizations in that new world that really turns sort of everything we're doing here on its side. Uh, inventing, I thought the technology was hard, that's easy. Inventing the organizations is hard but wonderfully re rewarding. It touches this very deep passion and that's what's coming in digital fabrication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. I'd now like to invite Alexandra up to the lectern. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. The plastic bag, a thing of progress. When they were introduced in the 1970s, plastic bags were seen as better than the paper bags that they were replaced. They were cheaper, stronger, used less material, and fewer trees are cut down to make plastic bags than paper bags. They were environmentally friendly. So much so that, that in 2001, we used somewhere, somewhere around a trillion of them worldwide. The disposable bag, as we know, is not really disposable. The plastic water bottle. In 2011, Americans drank 34.4 billion litres of bottled water, and that was 4% more than in 2010. Plastic bottles are safer than glass, they're lighter than glass, and so they use less carbon as they're transported. They're better. But are they? Really? We solved the problem of convenient drinking water, but we've made a massive new problem of waste, and yet we all use them every day. The energy saving light bulb, I'm sorry, the incandescent light bulb replaced by something better. The energy saving light bulb. It uses less energy when you switch it on, it lasts for longer, but while we threw the old ones out, these ones have to be recycled to stop mercury leaching into the ecosystem. And recycling uses a lot of energy, and many people don't recycle them. Is this better? Well, of course, it's much more complicated than that, but we assume that design and engineering will make things better. We take for granted that's what they do. But what do we mean by better? Do we mean longer lasting, cheaper, more sustainable, more high tech? Better for whom? Who's better ultimately shapes our common future? The plastic bag, the plastic bottle and the energy saving light bulb are all really common examples of how design and engineering and technology can take a problem and solve it, but give us more problems in the process. 80% of the environmental impact of the products, services, and infrastructure around us is determined at the design stage. Yet we keep on doing the same things over and over again and expect different results. And what do we often call such behavior? Insanity. Einstein said a lot of clever things. This one's just attributed to him, but he did also say this. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we use, we use when we created them. And I think as designers and engineers, working together, we can. And I think we must do much more than this, solve problems. We need to challenge those problems and ask different, more relevant questions. <coughs> yes, engineering design is about solving problems. But design, and I, I am a designer, so this is a caveat, is about something different. I think it's about possibility, life as it could be. Design makes new possibilities out of existing matter. It projects into our future. But designers have become problem solvers too. I think we need to get back to this idea that design can help shape our future. And it's to the future that I look now. Can, today I'd like to talk about how we might use design to help ask better questions instead of solving the wrong problems. Can design take a useful role upstream in the development of new technologies to help ask better questions? By affecting the direction a technology takes before we even get to problem solving, can we use design to help alter the future? 
This is something I've been experimenting with in my own practice. And today I'd like to tell you about an unfamiliar field that I've been working in as a designer to ask these kinds of new questions and to tell you about a project that's designing different ways of thinking. And I'd like to share with you some of the collaborations that I think hint at new ways of working. So I'm a designer, but for the last five years I've been interested in this, and we learned a bit about it yesterday. This is a plate of agar jelly that's covered in bacteria, and they were engineered by undergraduates so that they go dark when they're exposed to light, like photographic film. They called it e coloroid because all biological designs need a good name. This is synthetic biology in a, in a basic form. And as we learned yesterday, its aim is to make biology and biological engineering more like computer science, standardised, predictable, repeatable. And its supporters believe that biological engineering like this could solve our problems and make the world a better place through applications like materials, fuels, energy and food. Biology and life with it is just becoming a 21st century material for design. But as an emerging field, there is as yet little precedent for what design means or fixed role for it, and which is why I think it's a really valuable space to test out new ideas about what design could be. Because at the moment, the focus is problem solving. How do we make yeast make jet fuel, or bacteria make rubber for tyres, or non-biodegradable plastics? The same things that we already have. What could be a disruptive technology risks disrupting nothing. I think we need not only to solve the problem, how do we make yeast make jet fuel, which is a big problem for the scientists, but we need to actually challenge that question. How do we make alternatives to jet fuel? And how do we use less fuel? Instead of just making technology to solve our problems, I think we need to ask why we're making it and what we want from it. And I think this is where novel and ethical innovation could happen that's better. So how do we bring this kind of thinking into the lab? So I'm going to tell you about one project I've been part of, Synthetic Aesthetics, running since 2010 and funded by the NSF and the EPSRC. We brought six artists and designers from very different disciplines into collaborations with synthetic biologists in labs and studios through residencies all over the world to think about these questions. Can you design nature? If we can, how do you design nature? And most importantly, how would you design it well? They crash their ways of working and thinking together and bringing critical discourse into the lab and the studio. And I'll tell you about three of the projects. We paired an architect and a plant scientist together. And you'd think there'd be nothing in common between what they do, but actually there was real overlap in the tools that they used. Fernand uses 3D models out of the data that he collects from plant cells, and David, the architect, uses biologically inspired genetic algorithms to design buildings. So they took artichoke cells, um, xylem cells from the artichokes, and looked at ha as how they grow. They actually solve the spatial problems between themselves and their neighbours. And they worked with a computer scientist to actually extract this data and turn it into a kind of computer programme that they could apply to other spatial problems to solve them. And what they're doing is actually challenging a core belief in synthetic biology that DNA programmed makes a biological computer. For them, the whole cell and its natural logic becomes the processor. And what they're doing is actually challenging a fundamental belief and presenting a new model and creating new spaces for research. We put two product designers from IDEO, a firm known for its design thinking, together with um, two cell biologists. And two things emerged from this that I found really interesting. The first was that, as a designer, I expect a messy process as I'm trying to work out what to make. There's an existential crisis somewhere along the way, and that's normal. But for science, it's told as a straight story. We did this, we did this, we found this. But science is inherently a creative process too. There is a messy sort of design process that goes on behind the scenes, and I think hiding this is restrictive to innovation. The second thing that the designers discovered is that this easy-to-engineer biological future is not here yet. We read about it, but it's very far away. So they had to resort to designing fictions, like this one, out of their workshops with the scientists. So this is a rendering of a future where maybe we'd grow cups in the lab and they contain bacteria, and um, as you drank water from them, the bacteria and nutrients would be released. But what's important here is this. I, I think it's this idea of bringing science, like early stage sort of fundamentals into a commercial design firm. 
and design thinking from a commercial side into a scientific laboratory? What kinds of new thinking would emerge? Could a design firm actually help identify what good practice would be for biological design? And could we see departments like MIT's Media Lab emerge where biological design and scientific research are happening alongside each other? I'll tell you about one more of the projects. Now, we paired a biologist with a smell artist. And they wanted to challenge this idea that we have, a, we have a cultural fear of biology. And they saw a conflict between the, the antibacterial world that we live in where we're spraying and killing everything with this future that's promised that's going to be powered by bacteria. This is the human microbiome. We are covered inside and out with bacteria. And we're increasingly understanding how much we rely on them to live. And some of those bacteria are found elsewhere. If anyone's ever had Limburger cheese, Limburger smells like feet because the same bacteria that are on your feet are in the cheese. So could you make cheese out of human bacteria? Well, yes, this is how cheese is made. Uh, as you get, you're stirring the curds, your hands are in there and bacteria comes off them, definitely adds to the flavour. So Christina and Cecil decided to take samples from the human microbiome and make cheese. Now, um, as you can see, my armpit cheese was, uh, was at the wrong place at the right time or right place at the wrong time. But I don't think this is going to solve a grand challenge. I'd like to say that. But I think it's really important. Context is everything. Not just for bacteria, but for the things that we make and design, whether they're biological or more traditional plastic bottles, for example. The things we design, we cannot separate them from the context that they sit in. We cannot separate them from the ecosystem or from our behaviours. We are what we eat, but in a synthetic biological future, it may be that we eat what we are. We're much closer to the bacteria we're planning to engineer than abstract discussions of engineering we can relate. Human cheese makes our symbiosis with bacteria tangible and well, smellable too. So we've just finished writing a book about this for MIT Press, which will come out next year. And I think what's so important is that 20 participants from completely different backgrounds, from architecture to music to protocells, have come together to address fundamental questions about what it means to design nature. And I think it's also key that this research was funded by science and engineering and not by arts and design, because it's meant that these kinds of questions and discussions go straight back into the scientific and engineering context, as well as feeding into the design and arts and policy communities. And this openness to discussion and ideas and questioning and experimentation is the real achievement here. The social, ethical and cultural implications are brought into the engineering design process. Implications and applications are inseparable. We need more projects like this, so that's a call out now. I've spoken today about how we must challenge the very nature of what we thought were the problems, and I've given a, a few examples of how design and art can come earlier in the development of new technologies to help us open up new areas of thought. I've touched on how we can do more than ask better questions. We can, we can, by asking better questions, we can actually give ourselves better problems to solve. So what are the right problems? Well, I think this is all about opening the debate, and that's the work that lies ahead. But I really believe that by asking better questions, we will have problems to solve that are better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Helen Storey. Good morning. Um, this is going to sound something like a once upon a time story with a sort of social purpose. Um, hopefully what we're seeing here is uh, a project called Catalytic Clothing, which I started with uh, Professor Tony Ryan about five years ago now. Um, it's our endeavour to try and deliver a new technology that can purify air through the surface of our clothing um, in order to help improve the quality of what we breathe in our ever-increasing sized cities around the world. I'm thought of as an artist, he's thought of as a, a scientist, but you could describe us both as designers, very much on, on what we've just heard here. We just design at different scales. Uh, he, deep down at the nano scale, when it comes to this particular project, and me within the fashion industry, which is basically the outer surface of us. Living in these urgent times, we've both kind of felt that both science and art need more utility. 
I mean, around the subject of art, that might be slightly contentious, but in order to work together along the same timeline, because the process of science and arts don't necessarily sit naturally together, it's been my challenge to ask my industry to slow down with its changing its mind every five minutes and to ask the science uh, world, if you like, to speed up um, by making better use of what we already know, perhaps making things in a more clever way. The idea for this project was actually sparked by a 14-year-old girl uh, when we were in a workshop. We were both giving on what it was like to be an artist and a scientist to work together. And she asked us why we didn't make better use of what already exists. Um, we asked her what she meant by this, and she said, well, in, in my case, my footsteps. You know, isn't that an energy source? Why aren't you doing more with my footsteps? Um, she was talking about ambient energy. At that point, Tony had to dash off to a, a, an important meeting at the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, but he described it as the most boring meeting he'd ever attended. Um, and under the desk, on the back of his agenda, he started to write um, uh, what was the calculation of the surface area of his suit. So I think the Royal Society of Chemistry can um, stake claim to being a point of inspiration for this project. He came dashing back to our workshop with a kind of eureka-shaped smile and announced that all of us were wearing a, a tennis court worth of surface area and that surely all we needed to do was to find a better way to use this and to find a purpose for it. Um, from then on, the project began to suggest a number of experiments that, that we should try, and we wanted to see if we could have more unexpected conversations and make our research process completely transparent um, and, and put it in the public eye so that the public could actually see what we were doing whilst we were doing this and see if it might inform our direction and perhaps even our eventual marketing message. Um, it's, I guess, I guess based on the idea that smart ideas are no good if no one's going to use them. And the idea of testing out our process on the public ahead of time would keep us, we hoped, world relevant. Um, this is probably where science and culture can continue to inform each other's processes. So we needed to grab public imagination with a kind of early advert of what it is we were exploring in order to kind of share our early research vision with the world outside. Um, we were lucky enough to have a supermodel who stepped forward and said that she would get out of bed for, for nothing. Um, Radiohead donated their music, and we made a short film in a week, um, and we sent it around the world to see what would happen, and this is the film.
well, it was rather a shady moment when you presented that to our sponsor and he said, have you, have you listened to the first line of that song? I said, w no, what, what do you mean? He said, well, it says if you have any big ideas, they're never going to happen. <laughs> and uh, I, I had to quickly say, it's, it's ironic, it's English, it's, it's fine. <laughs> um, we built a, a, a viral campaign around that uh, uh, film and uh, uh, I'm sort of uh, mid-50s, if you like, as an age and I, the internet wasn't around when I first started doing art. But the idea was to track um, every single tweet, every blog, every Facebook mention, every conversation we could around the world uh, and we tracked it in real time. And um, we created something called a living map. And this was in order that the, the global conversation around this idea, we could uh, get a sense of whether people understood it, whether they liked it, whether they were worried about it. Um, and this particular mechanism, we're now working with a group called Freeformers and Facebook to try and find a way of using it as a way of testing out research ideas with the public before they're committed to with millions of pounds behind them, etc. Um, so we managed to reach about 300 million people in 147 countries in a three-month period. We set this on a three-month period as the thing to do. And we listened to their kind of hopes and fears and doubts and further questions. We also had many questions from what I'd call the Sunday afternoon scientist who drove us absolutely... Mm. Uh, but we got a clear sense of what they really wanted to know. And what they were asking us is how does it work and how does it affect me? So in brief, well, what we're using is TiO2, titanium dioxide. It's commonly found in toothpaste, sunscreen, some foods. It requires UV light and oxygen to trigger the catalyst. It removes NOx, nitrogen and oxides. It has impact on VOCs, MRSA and C. difficile viruses. One person wearing their own clothes, and, and this is the point of it, it's not about buying new special clothes. It's about radicalising the clothes you already own. Um, through the laundry process, we'll be able to remove about 5G of nitrogen oxides from the air, roughly the equivalent of a family car's daily output, if you like. Or put another way, at a typical London street, um, it would take 80% of the pollution out of the air at the rate of your natural walking flow along a pavement surface. We also allayed people's fears that they would simply become dirt magnets. There was this ideal notion they thought they just became sponges and they were the ones carrying the dirt, which is not how technology works. There were worries around impacts on water life and the source and the uh, basic supply of TiO2. So we were able to address all of these things before the product actually existed. Um, and as our experiment went on, um, and we're still not quite sure why, we found out that blue denim is the most efficacious surface of all. Um, and uh, as there are more denim jeans on the planet than there are people, if we could only get it to work on jeans, we'd probably be doing quite a good job. So my job immediately was to respond to this latest news, if you like, in the research. And we created these um, fields of air purifying genes, which we took around different kind of cities and towns. as another way of being able to talk about it in a very mainstream way. The project nowadays has uh, developed a kind of life of its own. It asks questions of us now rather than the other way around. Um, and most notable is, is uh, how the technology works in terms of it being at scale. If it's in a laundry product, you can't kind of brand a bit of the atmosphere Unilever or a bit of the atmosphere P&G. You know, how are we going to get this to work so that everybody can use it? So we've decided not to patent anything. We want it to be stolen. We want everybody to use it. A second question has arisen around how the technology works in terms of individual benefit to people. Um, as things stand, as I'm walking forwards, the person behind me is benefiting from the air that I'm generating um, and, and, and vice versa. I'm benefiting from the person who's walking ahead of me. So a big challenge from the marketing departments of these big companies is how do you sell altruism? You know, they're used to making you thinner, you more beautiful, your house cleaner. But how are we going to sell a benefit that appears to be benefiting somebody else and not you? Um, we've thought long and hard about these questions and we have found technical solutions to them. Um, so just finally to end on, on my bit, Catholic Clothing as a project has kind of raised as much interest in the nature of technology as collaboration itself. Um, particularly this project, even though I've been working for about 15 years across the arts and sciences. Um, so I thought I'd end just with a few observations of, of when collaboration seems to work quite well. Um, the first, however, though, is that true collaboration is quite difficult to speak of, uh, especially when it's successful. It's quite hard to fathom. It seems to work through its action and less through its explanation. It's a living thing, a sort of form of continuous alchemy. And if you stop to analyse it too closely, the power of it seems to disappear at some level. 
I have noticed a key starting place for the best chance of success appears to be the need for inequality in how much not knowing you're both able to bear. Initially, not knowing each other very well, then potentially not knowing each other's disciplines, and finally, not knowing what your rigorous endeavour may or may not deliver. Without this ability, one of you is going to bail early, uh, or at least minimise the kind of future potential of what you're capable of. Um, that colliding disciplines and extreme disciplines together does seem to deliver an ability to come up with ideas of value that the lone mind finds difficult to generate. Um, and I found that right the way across sort of 15 years. And perhaps deeper than that, that when a partnership is in true flow, an almost intuitive sense of the other surfaces, you know when to make your contribution and you know when to shut up. And at its best, it allows the other person to realise a creative part of you in totally unexpected and unprecedented ways. Lastly, collaboration that punctures above its weight requires a form of human entanglement that can experience vulnerability as the brother or sister of creative courage. Um, when it works truly well, it, and what appears to happen is that it, it challenges, if you like, our, our biggest uh, challenge to our advancement and flourishing, and that is our ability to experience our lives through the prison of we as opposed to the prison of me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. And our final speaker is Eric Brown. Good morning. It's uh, really a, a privilege to be able to talk to this audience of uh, very well-known engineers and uh, the, the, the conference committee here. Uh, after yesterday's very interesting session, however, I find myself with a bit of an identity crisis. Uh, in the education session, I believe Professor Chris Wise gave uh, very crisp definitions of a scientist and engineer, a scientist being somebody who observes the natural world and tries to make sense of it in here, while an engineer uh, tries to create things in here and produce them out in the, in the world. Um, but I give my profession as a computer scientist. And as I thought about that, I thought, well, there aren't computers out in the wild that I'm trying to understand as a scientist. So am I a scientist or an engineer? And uh, I thought about it a little bit more and actually uh, I work on the software side of things, and as uh, we call ourselves software engineers, uh, we actually often find ourselves doing battle with the hardware, and the hardware is in fact somewhat of a, a foreign object that we're trying to understand, so there is quite a bit of science there. And this notion was further confirmed just moments ago when I was talking with Neo, who was saying that he suspects that this whole von Neumann architecture is actually all wrong, and that explains why software and hardware struggle to work together at times. So. You know, this notion of, of what a scientist is uh, actually is a little more relevant to my topic today, which is the meaning of the word scientist depends on the context in which you're using it. And this phenomena is actually uh, uh, common to natural human language in general. And what I'm going to talk about today is technology that's all about trying to understand human language and deal with these challenges of the nuances of language, the ambiguities of language, and the fact that its definition is so contextual and, and can change over time, in fact. So I want to touch on uh, really five quick topics here. Uh, first, this notion of big data, and uh, it's a topic that was hinted at yesterday, but hasn't really been discussed yet, and it's really this notion of not, not in the, the physical world, but in this world of data, how do we leverage all of this data and actually evolve it from raw data to information to then actually knowledge that we can act on. And the technology that we believe will evolve to help us do that is something we're calling cognitive systems. And so I want to talk about this Watson system and introduce that to you as an example of a cognitive system talk briefly about how we've actually leveraged Watson to demonstrate it as an example of STEM technologies. And uh, it actually, uh, as we've demonstrated it on a television show, is one example of sort of combining this notion of entertainment with technology to make it a little more publicly interesting and palpable. I'll talk a little bit about the keys of building Watson and then finally some applications of Watson to healthcare. So let me start with this notion of big data. And really the challenge here is recognizing that uh, 
data is just growing at a tremendous rate. And in fact, 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. And so in, in business, this is a huge problem for uh, people to leverage that data and make sense of it and apply it to their business. And in particular, the fact that 80% of this data is unstructured. And so, for example, text, a form that computers typically struggle to deal with, it uh, is a serious problem that we're trying to address. And it's a, just a growing problem, especially with so many devices here, one trillion devices connected that generates an exabyte of data uh, in a year. And uh, to give you a specific example from the healthcare domain, you can see that uh, this is a big problem in healthcare as well. The amount of medical information is doubling every five years, yet physicians have very little time to actually keep up with all this data. Um, some uh, surveys show that more than 80% of physicians spend less than five hours a week, uh, actually I think that chart should say five hours a week, keeping up with the latest medical literature. Yet we all know that it's critical for physicians to keep up with that literature and be able to apply the latest research results and best practices. Uh, on top of that, you see some challenges in, in healthcare in general. A lot of these issues were discussed yesterday. Uh, in the U.S., for instance, we waste uh, about 30% of our healthcare dollar due to problems in healthcare. And so this is a huge opportunity to make improvements and, in particular, leverage big data or unstructured information to solve those problems. This is a chart we like to use that we call the hockey stick chart at IBM, which gives you a sense of the growth in data um, that the left-hand axis is giving you the volume. The right-hand uh, y-axis uh, just applies to that red line, which says what percentage of this data is uncertain. And you can see where we are today with uh, nearly three ex uh, exabytes of data. That's 10 to the 18th. But the growth trend is really quite shocking and uh, suggests that this problem of big data is just growing and is really something we need to tackle. And the way that we're going to tackle that is by leveraging what we call cognitive systems. So now we've taken a, a fairly high level and coarse classification of computing and decided to separate the initial era of tabulation from the second era of programmable computers to now what we believe is the next era of computing that we're calling cognitive computing systems. And this is not to say that cognitive computing will replace programmable computers, but will start to enhance and produce solutions that are required to address problems in this big data and unstructured data era. And there are really three key elements to cognitive computing that I like to think about. One is, initially at least, it's all about expanding human cognition, developing technologies to help humans apply the power of their brains by giving them better, more efficient access to all of this data so they can factor that into their very sophisticated reasoning process. And we see that when we talk about applying this technology in the medical domain and creating decision support tools that can give physicians access to this huge volumes of medical information. The second aspect is more natural interactions between humans and computers. So in the programmable era, humans have been forced to adapt the way they work to the way the computer works. In this cognitive era, we imagine the computers really adapting to the way humans work and interacting much more naturally. And the third key element of the cognitive era is this notion of learning in a whole variety of ways to scale these systems out to address these big data issues. We can't simply reprogram them every time we have come to a new domain. We have to come up with learning techniques that allow these systems to adapt automatically as they're used by humans. So let me give you a quick example of some of the challenges of dealing with natural language. And so uh, first, computers are very good at dealing with structured information. So if I want to know uh, who ran a GE or what company did Jack Welch run, if I have a database of structured information with a table that says people and the organizations that they ran, it's very easy for me to extract uh, or for the computer to pull out Jack Welch as the runner of GE. However, if I wanted to answer that same question from unstructured information and I had this sentence, if leadership is an art, then surely Jack Welch has proved himself a master painter during his tenure at GE. Now, how do I find the answer to the question, 
Uh, what did Jack Welsh run, or who ran GE? From this sentence, we might infer, well, at least Jack Welsh was a, a really good painter at GE, but if you read the language, you know that uh, this is really a way of describing Jack Welsh as the person who ran GE. And in natural human language, there are just so many examples of the ambiguity and challenge of dealing with natural language. You know, noses that run while feet that smell, uh, how can houses burn up as it burns down, etc. So this is uh, an interesting challenge of dealing with natural language. And we've uh, uh, tackled this problem by starting with question answering technology. And this has actually been an active area of research for decades. You can go back to 1970 and find a paper in the communications of the ACM that's a survey of the state of the art in question answering. So now this is 43 years ago where question answering technology was being summarized. Yet, as of uh, the early 2000s, the technology really had not matured to a point where it could be applied in a commercially viable way. So it was at this stage when, at IBM, we decided to really drill down into this problem and elevate it to what we internally called a grand challenge problem and really tackle it. And this was the emergence of the Watson system as a, a problem to try and solve and address challenges of question answering. The way that we wanted to demonstrate this was in uh, a very public way, and somebody hatched this notion of building a computer system that could compete on Jeopardy. So for those of you not familiar with Jeopardy, it's an American quiz show. It's actually quite popular. It's been around for, uh, I think, since the 1950s. The current format has been around for about 25 years, where you basically have three human players uh, answering questions. There's a clue board with six categories and five clues in each category with different clue vo dollar values. But the clues are not initially revealed. So a human will pick one of those clues. The text of the clue is revealed. The host reads the clue. The three players uh, attempt to come up with their answer. And then when the host is finished reading the clue, the first person to ring in gets to answer that clue. This is basically how Jeopardy works. We wanted to build a computer system that could compete on that quiz show at the same level as a human champion. And here you see some of the elements of Jeopardy that make it uh, fascinating. It has a broad open domain, it deals with complex language, it requires high precision, accurate confidence, and high speed. And so these were all of the issues that we needed to address in this technology to solve this quiz show problem, and yet they transferred directly to a number of business problems. Now I said I would talk about how we applied this to the, the problems of STEM and reaching out to students. Uh, I happened to be visiting a middle school and talking about Watson and presenting it to some students and was using this real Jeopardy clue as an example. And this is for, from the category Lincoln Blogs and it's about the 16th American president, Abraham Lincoln, who uh, was president from 1861 to 1864. And the clue is Treasury Secretary Chase just submitted this to me for the third time. Guess what, pal, this time I'm accepting it. Anyone? Want to hazard a guess as to what it is? Is resignation. That is, in fact, the correct answer. And the challenge of this question is, if you're not familiar with uh, Abraham Lincoln or Civil War era U.S. history, you might not know the answer, so you have to look at the contextual clues. What are things that are submitted? What are things that are accepted? And uh, we're talking about politics, so being cynical, we probably will assume that it's a resignation that is being submitted. I posed this question to some sixth graders when talking about Watson, not really expecting them to know. One girl raised her hand and uh, very bravely, and she responded, what is a friend request? <laughs> and so I, I found this answer fascinating on a number of levels. Um, now, I'm sure that if um, Lincoln had had Facebook back in 1860, he would have been friends with Chase. But uh, <laughs> what's more interesting is how the, the, the definition of, or, or the meaning of submitted and requested, again, very contextual. So for the sixth grade student, that goes to a friend request. And again, speaks to the challenges of dealing with natural language. So this Watson technology, which I'm not going to have time to go into in much detail, is all about applying a whole series of, uh, of different uh, areas of research from natural language processing to machine learning to information retrieval to knowledge representation and reasoning, and ultimately building an architecture, and now I'm talking about software architectures, that allow us to combine and integrate all of these analytics, and in fact, over 100 different analytics, 
and then using machine learning to weigh and combine all of their results to come up with answers. So here's a brief history of the project and uh, some general areas that we consider interesting. I just want to highlight one topic in particular, which is the application of this technology to the healthcare space. As a, our research team is collaborating with the Cleveland Clinic to uh, address, uh, again, this challenge of leveraging all of this medical knowledge to physi assist physicians. And in particular, we're working with their Learner College of Medicine, which uses what they call problem-based learning, uh, an approach to education that was discussed quite a bit yesterday. Rather than uh, learn from textbooks, they take their medical students and break them up into small groups and give them rich problems to then drill down into, diagnose, and essentially work through a case study. We're looking at ways to apply this Watson technology to both support that research and case study process and also allow students to interact with the system in what we call a collaborative learning system to actually help Watson become better and more intelligent and uh, work us towards this notion of a cognitive computing system. So let me just finish by saying what I'm really talking about today is knowledge as essentially a natural resource, but in order to leverage that natural resource, we have to have technologies like cognitive computing systems that elevate it from data to information to knowledge. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. So uh, we begin our Q&A session. If we could have the, high s the house lights up, please. If we can ask the panelists to shuffle forward a bit so we can see the front row. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the format as yesterday, if you could raise your hand, I, I will try to come to as many of you as possible, but I think uh, some of you will be disappointed. Um, uh, there are roving mics. If you could wait for the mic to arrive and then stand up, give your name and affiliation, and then ask your question. Thank you. So, Gentleman there with the hand up, and then someone there at the end. Yeah. So, yes, in the middle. Jamie Hestikin, University of Arkansas. I guess this is more for Professor Ginsburg, but anyone can answer it. We've heard two central themes the past few days, one of scarcity and one of the environment. And... We've had lots of clever solutions of solving them, but when you talked about the water bottles, you know, there's an easy solution for that about putting distributed water and people filling with their own cups and they can still get the benefits. When we talk about doubling gas mileage and, and things like that, there's the, the answers that, hey, we can put two people in every car. So are we doing a good enough job as engineers of saying, hey, this isn't CFCs. We can't just get rid of it. We can't solve this problem by ourselves. We need society to take these easy answers and do it for us. Um, and so that part of the solution has to be a non-engineering answer. I think um, yesterday this was brought up on the panel about the you know, how you reduce people's electricity consumption. And it is so much of it is behavior, but it comes from so many different you know, directions. If you have big corporations saying everyone's got to drink Coca-Cola or Pepsi or bottled water because that sells, then how do we, you know, it's down to everyone to, to do that. But it's, it, maybe it's not possible. I mean, that's what it seems like at the moment. You know, I can say all these grand things about, you know, we shouldn't drink bottled water, but I'm sure I will use one bottle of water today at least. And that's just something that we, we, we talk about these big challenges and we don't actually modify our behavior at all. And that's why I started with such a simple example, because it's something that we're all guilty of. Thank you. Thank you. Neil, do you want to add to that? You? Um, or just a, a minor comment. Uh, when we did early work on embedded internet, we found appalling things like building use three quarters of electricity, and they waste a third because of not just inefficiency, but just dysfunction of stuff working wrong. And there, the insight, the best tool we found for changing behavior was making the consequences of behavior apparent. So sort of nagging didn't work, but visualizing how energy was being consumed in ways that weren't apparent so people could see consequences of their action did have a big impact. So I think, I think a piece is, is uh, exposing what you can't perceive in the consequences of your action. We've seen works better. Our second questioner. Uh, E.B. Freeman, University of Rochester. Um, I was, I'm responding to the concept of better um, because you make the point that um, if you combine art artistic value with engineering value, you might produce a better solution. 
what I heard was somebody else gets to pick what better means. And who's to say that your decision of better is better than my decision of better? So I kind of reacted to that. So I wanted your comment on that. Yeah, that's great. That's what I want to do research about next because we all have a different, everyone in this room has a different understanding of what that means. We're all saying we want a better future, but everyone's actually thinking something completely different. And the, you know, there's political drivers to that and economic drivers are very different from the person on the street. And until we can even decide, you know, does it mean that someone who's living in a, in a, you know, not even living in a house, what, what does that mean for them? And I think that that's actually a fundamental question that we need to look at is, and how do we actually construct that dream? Because the dream is very different from, from the reality. And... Good dream is different than my Sorry? Good dream is different than my dream. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, until we actually all say what we're all thinking of when we're imagining the better future and that the future is going to be better, I think that that's the first part of the, the problem that needs solving. Okay, so questioner here. Yes, keep your hand up, and then uh, ooh, okay, and someone up at the top next. Yes, uh, Jyoti Mazumdar from University of Michigan. Uh, my question is especially for uh, Professor Garsfeld. More than a decade back, I published a paper. I call it design material, not digital material. And what I found that when you're trying to put different material in a different pixel big challenges at the interface and the information how the interface will interact. And you may design something with hoping for certain properties and we use the homogenization design and we found that unless I put the information on the interface uh, physics, uh, it doesn't work. It deviates from your own prediction. Uh, so what else, my question to you probably for clarification, when you're talking about these uh, digital materials, how you are inputting the in interface information because they'll vary from materials to materials and almost in all the theme, you're manipulating material, organic or inorganic, <laughs> and how those information will be put in, in our overall software structure. Um, well, there's different answers on different length scales. The recurring theme is when, if you send a movie over the internet, in transit, it's represented as a small set of discrete states in the symbol space of the channel, and there's a very close analog. So in the electronic example I showed, the way we're building microelectronics and reversible process is not with a wide range of materials. It's a very small basis set, a conducting voxel, an insulating voxel, a resistive voxel, a semiconducting voxel with well-characterized interfaces. Then with just the conducting and insulating voxels, based on how you place them, you can get inductors and capacitors and strip lines and matching ne networks and antennas. With one dissipative voxel, you can get every two-terminal passive device, and then you can build up a hierarchy from there. In the same sense for the aerospace composites, it's analogous, but it's uh, linking fiber loops that transfer forces. Um, in the nanostructures, it's a different answer. It's DNA bricks. But in each case, it's a very small set of parts with well-characterized interfaces. And then we're finding you synthesize material properties out of that, discrete, that very small discrete set of materials rather than into it. So you're right, the materials matter. But we're sort of addressing that by having a very small basis set of materials with well-characterized junctions and then building complex materials out of rather than into them and how they're arranged. Thank you. Okay, so the question up in the gallery. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Chet. I'm a student bioengineering at MIT. Uh, my question is, as biology begins to move into this um, realm of programming where the idea of open sourcing is very ubiquitous, um, the idea of intellectual property is a non-negligible consideration. So yesterday we heard from Dr. Venter, who, um, not to take away from any of his accomplishments, but has very controversially tried to patent uh, DNA sequences, basically. And on the other hand, we have Professor Story here who has um, developed a technology that is completely unpatented and open source. So I was wondering if the panel could comment on uh, the thoughts between the push and pull between innovation but also business sustainability as biology tries to move into this hybrid paradigm. Thank you. Well, I think probably several people can have mm. something to say. Eric? Sure. Well, you know, coming from an industrial research lab, I think uh, the, the first possible response to that is that this whole patenting process, at least initially, was set up to uh, 
make this, invent this inventive technology more available so that uh, people wouldn't just keep everything internal and trade secret, but rather uh, have a mechanism for publishing it and then also being able to protect it, but that other people could build on it in, in some fashion. And so now, of course, it, businesses are interested in uh, capitalizing on that, so there's always going to be a, um, uh, some sort of a commercial aspect to that. But ultimately, every business has to make a decision about uh, what, to, what to invest in and then how to uh, get some return on that. And in many cases, um, the, cho the, better, the best choice is to open source something and make it more broadly available to the community to, to build up a larger community and create even more business opportunities. So if I can no. build on that. Uh, in my day job, when, when we do projects that represent billion dollar infrastructure investment, we do patents because there's a high barrier to entry. There's a small set of players that can practice it and it's easy to identify infringement. Anything you do in a DIY bio lab or a fab lab or a hacker space, we don't patent because there's no barrier to infringement. Anybody anywhere can do it. The world's full of bitter inventors holding up a patent saying, I have a patent, not understanding. It's just simply access to the legal system. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a, a patent has to be enforceable. So pat uh, intellectual property in that sense goes away in this world when anybody makes anything. It doesn't mean business models go away, but it's exactly like the story of um, software and music. Uh, software tried uh, copy protection, music tried DRM, they failed. It annoyed honest people and it was easy to avoid for dishonest people. Um, what's emerged is markets of app stores and track stores where you can sell into um, 100, 1,000, a million that didn't exist before. So there still is a place for conventional and IP in markets with a high barrier to entry. Um, in all these other areas, what emerges are business models, um, but the business models aren't based on protecting a scarce resource. It's exactly the script. Again, in one case, the code becomes sound. In one case, it becomes an app. In one case, it becomes an object. In one case, it becomes a living thing. But it's all really the same story. So you, you, you get value from your creation, but you, it, it, IP doesn't work as protecting a scarce resource anymore. Can I ask another question? Y yes, you can. <laughs> Panelists can ask each other questions. Lab seems the way to go, um, and, but I, I was wondering if um, a young person came up with an idea that then actually if it was scaled would then be a greater use beyond their own personal fascination with it. How, how does IP then work in at that kind of level? Yeah, so it, 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 it's a great question in that I, I think what I've learned from the Fab Lab story is sorry, I, I've become democratically elitist. <laughs> um, you know, at, at, MIT's core competence is it's a safe place for strange people who don't fit. Um, inventive people don't fit, they don't follow rules. There's places like MIT where they fit. And what we're finding, and it's not profound, but they're just all over the place. In you know, rural African villages, you know, above the Arctic Circle, we find exactly those people. And you know, elite institutions fit a small fraction. And so what we're learning is how to tap a much greater fraction of the planet's brain power. Not by saying you're smart, you have to leave, now come to MIT, but sort of bringing the tools to them. So exactly to your question then, sort of what is the life cycle arc? And what we found, the Fab Academy I mentioned is because kids like that fall off an educational cliff. And so we're looking at how to bring, not distance, but distributed education to them. And then for creating businesses, um, what didn't work was the obvious thing of you start a business and make a conventional company because then to grow, it sort of disconnects from the communities they live in and sort of the life cycle of how they live. What we're finding is we have to create entirely new business platforms where you go to market by shipping data, you produce on demand, and fulfillment is distributed. That's an entirely new kind of business platform. But again, exactly go back to music and software in music track stores. You know, briefly, Napster comes, yippee, it's free, nobody pays anybody. Labels implode. Now we have this new ecosystem that's let all kinds of musicians emerge that wouldn't have access to a market, selling into one, 10, 100, 1,000, a million. The label still exists, but arguably that's the least interesting music. In the same sense, um, the large software companies exist, and with some, other than some compelling exceptions, arguably that's the least interesting software. There's all the app writers that sort of emerge. And so that's what we see coming is, 
you know, the, the bright kid in the village gets compensation through designs that people make and their systems to track the contributions. But you, like giving up DRM and music, you abandon trying to protect it as a scarce resource. You try to build platforms for how it flows. But the platform for distributed buying and selling of fulfillment on demand where you ship data to go to market just doesn't exist. And the heroes of kind of the last industrial revolution we found won't get us there because it's not their story. And so we've had to spend much more time than I expected on that kind of infrastructure to answer that question. Yeah. Helen, I wanted to ask you regarding that uh, question about IP. I mean, you, you, you didn't take out a patent on your catalytic clothing um, idea. I mean, did, were you aware of the world of business perceiving this as, I mean, was it altruism or naivety, do you, do you think? Or, or <laughs> well, we, or, or something else. We knew what we were giving up. Yeah, it, 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 was, um, it was one of those things that once we realized that actually a single person doesn't benefit, that there is an altruistic act that goes with it, that actually it's going to need a new business model in order to support that. And in some ways, one of the powers of the project was it was beginning to ask us to reorientate ourselves, a bit like what you were saying, about uh, the value of an idea and who it belongs to if you're going to now be in a hurry, as we all are now, to fix things. Um, so it's, it's this balancing act between staying in the system and outside of the system and just finding which one is actually going to have the greatest benefit the quickest. Um, I mean, to some degree, one has to care slightly less about yourself in order to get these things to where they need to be. Um, but I th it feels to me it's got some of the future in it, even though we haven't got all the answers yet but giving it away seems to be the only way it's going actually going to have the impact it needs to have. Thank you. Um, I'd like to come and ask um, two questions that have come through from uh, Birmingham. Good morning, Birmingham. Um, so the, the first one's for, for you, Daisy. Um, can you put hindsight into the design process? Because surely the problems created by past solutions weren't perceived as such at the time. I think I... I left my crystal ball at home this morning. Um, I think that's, ex I mean, we make the same mistakes over and over again. And you know, maybe I'm a Luddite, I don't think I am. But I think that the blind faith is, is potentially part of the problem. I think that we know that these things don't work, and yet we keep on making them. So can we find ways, maybe it is through interdisciplinary collaboration, maybe it is by bringing artists and designers and engineers together to actually, and, and all sorts of disciplines, and experts, because there's lots of experts, rather than just driving forward in one way. Um, you know, what Helen's doing by saying, you know, breaking open a business model is, I mean, that's the only way that we know that the, we already have the information. We just need to start sort of activating it better, I think. But. Thank you. Um, so since asking the first question, yet another one's come through, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll choose that this is a really nice one. I want to have the, all the panel's views on this. What are the ethical and security implications of enabling anyone to print anything anywhere? And how should these be addressed or controlled? For instance, the blueprint for a gun being available. So that, that's an easy one. Uh, along with the misinformation about 3D printing and stories that don't use it and don't understand it is this one, in that um, for a long time it's been easy for a moderately well-equipped workshop to make weapons. 3D printers make bad weapons. A moderately equipped workshop can make good ones. That's just not new. It's a common question. I've had you know, military chiefs and intelligence analysts panic over the idea of these tools in war zones. But what we've found is exactly the opposite. Um, here's a vignette. We have one of these fab labs in Giza in Egypt. And um, during the last round of rioting, one of the people running it called and said, oh my god, are you safe? Are you OK? And they said, are you kidding? It's one of our best days ever. Because all of the bright, creative, interesting people who have no interest in sectarian conflict were in the lab working <laughs> while people were pounding themselves on the street. So we have labs, you know, the Protestant Catholic boundary in Northern Ireland and Afghanistan. What we find is hurting people is a well-met market need. You, you don't need personalization. There's a fabulous supply chain for that already. Um, the need this is filling is bright inventive people. And they use it to do everything but that. You could make weapons, but you don't need it for that. It's, it, it, it's tapping more of the brain and power of the planet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, um, 
the, the question is sort of self-adjusting as a species. And yeah, I, you know, I, uh, I don't necessarily believe in all-seeing power of the crowd, but I believe in sort of common sense and clever people. And, and they're all over the place. And you know, what I've learned from all, all the time in developing countries is people know what to solve and they know a lot about how to solve it. They don't have access to the means to do it. And there's sort of nobody on the beat of providing advanced tools to solve technical problems that are locally integrated. And so you know, a big piece for me is providing access to the tools. This topic came up even yesterday in one of the questions, and uh, this, this whole notion of what are the different applications for any kind of technology, and, and uh, you could always imagine applications for evil, but also applications for good, and I think in history you see technologies evolving in both directions, uh, and a very crisp example is GPS, which you, you can imagine was originally developed uh, for military applications, but today everybody uses it in very civil and highly productive applications. And so I, I think this question it always has the same answer for any kind of technology. We had a, a, a question near the back. That, yes, um, if you come forward, put your hand up, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jeremy Watson. I'm research director at Arup, engineering company, and I'm interested in looking at the range of activity between the product design end right through to designing districts and cities and how we can use design and engineering disciplines to influence behavioral outcomes and I just wonder just how feasible you think that is the reverse transform from the preferred outcomes which might be well-being or energy efficiency through to what are the design challenges and engineering challenges and how to address those thank you if I could make a starting comment I it, in a sense, I'd like to banish the conversation that says design and engineering in that um, the how to make anything class I teach is uh, circuits, microcode, 2D, 3D, just sort of all of that. And, and it's full of artists and what you'd call designers. But there's a new sense of designer emerging who's learning means of expression that came since the Renaissance. And so there's sort of this emerging designer who knows how to do finite element modeling and write microcode and you know, do all of those pieces not distinct from engineering. And we're, we're seeing that across scales. We're seeing it in biology. The example I showed of building buildings and increasingly cities, it's being done as rapid prototyping on scale. So I think a big piece of the answer to your question is sort of losing this distinction of the designer versus the engineer. to me working with a lot of young designers coming up that's, that some of them have become frozen in the headlights about designing at all now since what we know about sustainability in the environment has become so prevalent and, and they now see themselves as being brokers that they're involved before stuff is made when stuff is made and after it's made um, and so it's designers as much as thinkers as actual makers of stuff I think that is going to help address some of what you were talking about Thank you um, we have time just for one more question I'm afraid Maybe the back there, yes. Alison Guerin from the University of Toledo Bioengineering student. I was wondering, I definitely think programs such as Watson could be definitely a very strong learning tool for people, but I was wondering what your thoughts are on if they could be taken advantage of and people would get lazy, you know, using that to, as their brain instead of their own. So I think that the, the quick answer to that is no. And uh, again, there was this, this topic was broached briefly yesterday about uh, when it came to math, whether we ought to just let computers take care of all the math and, and um, sort of save people from that, uh, that drudgery. And, uh, but I think, uh, at least in the case of Watson, the, the initial uh, expectation is that it's expanding the power of human cognition. And so completely replicating what the human brain does, I'm not sure is achievable, but leveraging the power of what computers do really well, which is be able to analyze huge volumes of information and uh, ultimately um, uh, summarize that and extract it in an efficient way and make it uh, as available to the human cognition process is really the more interesting part of the problem. 
Thank you very much. Well, uh, I, we've already had a, a fascinating session. We're running perfectly to time this morning, so that's, that's very good. Before I ask you to join me in thanking the panellists again, um, I'll just say we're, we're now going to break for coffee, uh, and we return here uh, around about 10 to 11 uh, for, for 11 o'clock start. Uh, just a, a quick announcement. Someone uh, had mentioned that they'd left some personal items in one of the conference bags. So if you do check your bag and you find something that doesn't belong to you, could you please hand it over to the desk? Um, please then join me in thanking our four panellists for a very wonderful start to the day. <laughs>